Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining Sunday service this week. Uh, we have a new new program from this this time. Master Oka have uh, published 50 first lectures in Happy Science, started from 1987. 50 lecture VDVD were published in Happy Science. And uh, these 50 lectures actually created the basis of Happy Science. It, developed into a kind of most uh, greatest religion in Japan, also spread worldwide. Uh, these 50 lectures series is kind of a secret of this special development, okay? First of all, uh, we recite the prayer to Lord, I can't say, Lord, prayer to the Lord together. If you have a prayer book, let's pray aside together. Where to the Lord? A low elkantar, you are the soul of all light, all power, all wisdom, and all love. May you give us light, give us power, give us wisdom, and give us love. O Lord, our Father, please protect this planet love first, protect us from all evil, and open the future for us. O Lord, thank you for giving us light. We give thanks from the bottom of our hearts. Hello. Okay. In this lecture uh, titled uh, The uh, Principles of Happiness. It's a uh, first public lecture master gave, and it was occurred uh, March 1987, more than 35 years ago in Tokyo. Uh, only 300 people gathered at the time from all, all over Japan, 300. That doesn't include me. <laughs> not, not, I was not a member at the time, only 300. Okay, but it was a historical new uh, lecture. And uh, most of people come here because they wanted to know who is Master Rihoka, who is Master Rihoka, and what is happy science. This question, for this, this question, they come to uh, this place. Okay, before entering the lecture, I will give some kind of a basic knowledge about uh, in the master teaching. Okay, uh, firstly, the different level of enlightenment, which is common in Buddhism. Buddhism. In Buddhism, there is a kind of state of enlightenment, arhat, bodhisattva, tathagata. The tathagata is equivalent in archangel in Christianity, very high. It is in the high eighth dimensional world, eighth dimensional realm in the real world. Bodhisattva, bodhisattva, lower than tathagata is an angel. Equivalent angel in Christianity, which they reside in the seventh dimensional realm. And also, our heart. Our heart is an angel to be, or lower angels. And he, they live in the upper pitch of the sixth dimensional realm. This is a kind of basic knowledge for this lecture, today's lecture. Then, uh, you, many of you don't know about uh, Buddhism much. And there are two major streams in Buddhism. One is Hinayana Buddhism. The other is the Mahayana Buddhism. Small vehicle Buddhism or great vehicle Buddhism. Hinayana Buddhism is focusing on the enlightenment of the this, uh, monks or nuns. Focused on the enlightenment, especially uh, practiced by the uh, Southeast Asian countries like Thailand, Malaysia, or like that. Not Malaysia, maybe uh, Thai and uh, uh, Sri Lanka, or like that. And Mahayana Buddhism, Mahaya Buddhism is focusing on salvation of many people, which is spread in China, Japan, Eastern Asian countries, mostly. 
Okay, with this background, we enter the master's first public lecture, The Prince of Happiness, which lasts around 90 minutes. Hello, everyone. I'm holding this lecture in March 1987, exactly six years after I awakened to this path of truth. Six years ago, on March 23, 1981, I suddenly began receiving revelations from the heavenly world. The first one came from spirits of Nichiren school of Buddhism. I've talked about it last time, so I won't go into detail. They were Nikko and Nichiren. They suddenly started sending me spiritual messages. Four or five years before that, when I was still 19 or 20, I was an ordinary university student without much interest in spiritual matters. In those days, however, when I was on a bus or a train, the word eternity would often appear. In big white letters before my eyes, I didn't know why I kept seeing the word eternity. It would happen from time to time, without any idea of what lay ahead. I would often say to my friends, in the future, I'd like to leave behind thoughts that will be handed down for 2,000 or 3,000 years. I was not aware of why I was saying this. But at that time, preparations had already begun. I had a vague dream of becoming a philosopher. Or at least doing literary work. But as time passed, my dream started to waver. During my days at the University of Tokyo, I became absorbed in reading books on a wide range of subjects. Although I was attracted to the concept of eternity, I was gradually influenced by my friends whose aim was to achieve worldly success. I became interested in the law which governs society and was unknowingly drawn to worldly success. Gradually, my wish to get ahead in the world became stronger. Because I had entered a prestigious university, I thought about how satisfying it would be for me. 
If I could get a respectable job and spend my life working there. At that time, I had two options. One was to stay in the academic world and become a scholar. Perhaps to specialize in political philosophy. The other was to achieve success outside academia. I continued to waver between these two. As graduation day approached, I still wished to pursue academia. But as I watched my friends trying to test their abilities in society, I was drawn to a career outside of academia. However, I faced roadblocks. At the time, I couldn't figure out why. In university, I studied hard. My classmates didn't have any trouble finding their careers. In my study group of six people, Everyone but me was successful in becoming a diplomat. High-ranking public servant or legal professional. Around the time of my graduation, I was also drawn towards such a path. But for some reason, whenever I tried to get a job, something happened to block my way at the last minute. For some odd reason, obstacles prevented me from going in the direction of my choice. I didn't know why. I became confused whether I should get a job. But one autumn day, I got a call from a trading company. Later, I was treated to dinner and was asked to work with them. Then I accepted their offer. At that time, I had a burning desire in me. But I was uncertain which direction I should channel this feeling toward, because no profession would have fulfilled my yearning. I couldn't find a job that matched my ideals. However, fate was cruel. Despite being brought up in the countryside and having no desire to go abroad, I began to work for a company involved in international trade. Soon after, I was sent to work in the United States. The living environment I was in was opposite to that of Buddhist or Christian seekers of truth. As I've already written in the booklet, Business Revolution, it was a dog-eat-dog -dog world where people were pursuing results. First thing in the morning, I would get coffee and skim through newspapers for the latest information or for useful information that no one else knew about. I would go to the office one or two hours earlier than others to read the telex from overseas, often more than 30 feet of paper. I would analyze them and consider the strategy to solve the problems as quickly as possible. Despite all this, I encountered a crucial turning point in my life. It was shocking to me. 
I was struck by a strong ray of light. Revelations from heaven revealed that I was on the wrong track for the course of my life. However, I had to make a living. After receiving revelations, I knew I couldn't continue living an ordinary life. But in the modern world, I couldn't possibly live on offerings like the monks of old times. So I wanted to balance my business career and the world of truth. While working in the business world, I still had a desire within me. Trading companies demanded extremely tough work, but also paid high salaries. They probably paid much better than other companies did. A company I worked for paid enough for a young employee like me to buy a new car with just one bonus. This was the reality. I couldn't easily give it up. Over the next four or five years, I continued seeking the truth while still working in the company. But it occupied less than 10% of my time, or perhaps 1% or 2% of it. And once every few months, I would see advisor Yoshikawa. To record spiritual phenomena and discuss them. But I was passive in getting them out. Now we've issued eight books of spiritual messages. But they are published under the name Saburo Yoshikawa. At that point, though I continuously received spiritual messages, it was still uncertain what lay ahead. So I decided not to take any action until I had a clear vision of the future. Also, many Happy Science members are in their 40s and 50s. So I'm still too young and inexperienced to stand and speak in front of you. Only 30 years and a few months old. At the time, I thought, the spiritual phenomena I am experiencing must be real. But if I start to teach people about them, I will surely fail. People will probably label me as a strange or insane person within a year. And I will stray from my path. After all, I knew I had to compensate for my lack of experience with patience and diligent efforts. So I decided to wait patiently until I gained the confidence to teach people the truth correctly. I thought I should be patient and wait without taking any action and believing the time to make a move will come before long. Since then, I've had various spiritual experiences. We've published spiritual messages from only dozens of spirits. But the number of spiritual phenomena I have experienced over the last six years amounts to tens or hundreds of times as many. I've had contact with hundreds of high spirits. For my first book, Spiritual Messages from Saint Nichiren, I spent four years accumulating conversations with him. There are a hundred times as many messages as contents of that book. That book has such a solid foundation. 
I decided not to make a move without building foundations for our movement. Most people would have preached as soon as Nichiren sent them messages and would have formed a new religious group in a year. I guess the spiritual guidance of Nichiren alone and the publication of 10 to 20 books of his spiritual messages would have attracted several million followers in a few decades. However, I felt things were far more serious. I realized that Nichiren was only a guide or a facilitator. And behind him were over 500 high spirits who were ready to support me. Then, three or four months after my first spiritual communication, I received messages from Jesus Christ. At first, advisor Yoshikawa didn't believe me. So I performed a spiritual message in front of him. That is how our numerous spiritual conversations began. Nevertheless, it was at least another three years before I finally confirmed that the messages from Nichiren were genuine. Nowadays, many of the new religions start preaching as soon as they experience spiritual phenomena, taking them as divine work. However, a religious leader bears responsibility. A simple mistake can not only mislead millions of people in this age, but also the people of future generations. The damage can't be settled easily. At this time, I have not announced where many of the founders of new religions have gone after death. But I know their whereabouts. Many people would be shocked if I were to release them, so I won't do that. But I'll release messages from those who went back to higher realms in heaven. If you don't find the messages from certain founders, you will know why. Some groups ask me to publish messages of their founders, but it might not be a good idea. No publisher would want to publish their messages, because all they say is, it's pitch black, I can't stand it, help me. It would only make the readers go crazy. I can't help but pity founders who fell to hell. It's very difficult to save them. They are aware of the mistakes they have made. But even if they correct their thoughts, that alone will not enable them to return to heaven. This is because their successors are still actively spreading their wrong teachings to millions of people. The founders pray for them to stop, but they won't. The more they work, the greater the founders suffer. Successors nowadays might express gratitude to the founder for the tenfold increase in members. But the founder thinks, now I'll have to stay here ten times longer. Instead of 200 years, I'll have to suffer for 2,000 years. I'm afraid I might forget that I was ever human. This is sad, but we can't save them easily. Why not? Usually I can send stray spirits to heaven after talking to them. For a couple of minutes, or an hour at most. But this is not the case with misguided founders. Because millions of followers still believe in their wrong teachings. Unless they solve this, they can't go to heaven. 
So instead of becoming misguided founders, it's better off to grow vegetables in the countryside. If they fall to hell for speaking ill of neighbors, they can return to heaven before long. Now I am introducing spiritual messages from Nichiren and Jesus Christ. But if they were false, then I most likely will never return to heaven and be reborn into this world. It'll be even worse if happy science spreads internationally. Through spiritual contact with many religious founders, I learned to be very cautious. This is why I didn't take action until I confirmed the authenticity of Nichiren. For four years, his character didn't change. The messages were so logical and inspiring that no living intellectuals could hope to deliver the content of a similar level. Conversely, no matter how sly hellish spirits are, their inconsistencies eventually show. Usually evil spirits complain of their pain, so it's easy to tell. However, the satans or demons that possess religious founders are very experienced and quite shrewd. They show off their religious knowledge on, for example, karma and reincarnation. They may even say, save people. This message is God's voice. So you must spread this message to the people. Publish my messages as a book and deliver it to each and every house. Even so, you need to be cautious. As I wrote in the booklet, How to Protect Yourself from Evil Spirits, it is important to have intellect or knowledge. Some evil spirits have strong spiritual powers or willpower. But because there is no school in hell to learn the truth, they don't have systematic knowledge of it. A spirit in hell who used to live as an esoteric Buddhist monk would know a lot about the esoteric teachings. Some say the monk who restored Shingon school in a sense was greater than Kukai. But after his death, he fell to hell and is currently possessing a religious founder and deluding people. He is versed in esoteric Buddhism, so average intellect can't see through his true nature. If you humbly study not only Buddhism, but also a variety of religions, like Christianity, Shinto, Confucianism, and Taoism, along with ethics, science, and philosophy, and you have grasped the golden thread that runs through their thoughts, you will find their inconsistencies. In contrast, those who believe exclusively in, for example, esoteric Buddhism or a particular sect of Christianity, and who keep their eyes shut tight against other ideas, can easily be deluded by Satans who are experts in that particular belief. You may come across these sorts of believers in certain new Christian sects. They've often tried to sell me the Bible. I think of giving spiritual messages from Christ. But that might stir even more trouble. So I always said, I know the Bible is precious. I already have one at home. 
Once, when I came out of a subway station, a woman came up and asked me, Could you spare me a moment? On seeing me being reluctant to say no, she said, You seem to be troubled. Of course I was troubled. I was wondering how I could escape her. She continued, perhaps you are possessed by a bad spirit. I can purify you if you can spare a couple of minutes. As I declined her on the streets, she said, why don't we go to a quieter place? Oh my goodness. If she had purified me, she would have fallen over backward. So I did my best to decline her offer. But she wouldn't give up. And insisted that she must save as many lambs as possible. Eventually, I had to ask her to let me go. Having observed new religions and seen their founders in the afterlife, I strongly resolved not to tread this path unless I took it seriously. I decided not to appear in public until I had spent four or five years confirming that the spiritual messages were from Nichiren and Christ. We were prudent and careful in exploring the truth. Usually, no one would wait six years after receiving messages from Nichiren or Jesus Christ. People would move sooner, but I waited until I was convinced they were real. My books of spiritual messages represent only 1% of all the knowledge that I have. They are carefully selected messages that I have analyzed from every angle and confirmed to be true. For the first two or three years, high spirits used expedient means to communicate with us because we were not enlightened, because we were not familiar with the world of spirits. They guided us little by little using words we could understand. Then, after a while, they took us to a higher level. Now, after six years, we realized we were at a very low level in our first one or two years. This is a funny story now, but we had a dog at my parents' house six years ago. Every night, the dog would bark furiously. So I asked Nichiren, is there an evil spirit possessing it? He kindly replied, yes, there are two snake spirits. So the dog is annoyed and barking furiously. I feel sorry for Nichiren. Due to such a low level, I had to ask him trivial questions. This is where I started. I started from scratch. I started just like all of you. Now, what if we had published this message? St. Nichiren, I have a question. Our dog keeps barking at night. I don't think this is natural. He must be influenced by an evil spirit. Is he possessed? Indeed, two snake spirits are possessing him. It would be too late for us to retract this later on. It takes two or three years to develop spiritual awareness. It applies to anyone. After going through this immature stage, you can go to the next level. There was a religious founder who passed away 11 years ago in June 1976. We published his spiritual messages in December 1986, and it attracted a lot of attention. Now he is not at peace. When he was alive, he started activities soon after experiencing spiritual phenomena. That was when he was 41 or 42. At the time, he was told that he would only live to 48. So he urgently started his activities. 
He conveyed the words of spirits he had written or heard. But in reality, it's very difficult in the first few years. I can say this based on experience. Until we develop spiritual awareness, high spirits use expedience. They need to do so to raise our awareness little by little. Even a great guiding spirit has to start from scratch at birth. So you need to wait three or four years to get familiar with and confirm what they say. I've talked to him for five or six years and he told me about the confusion in his group. He now wants me to straighten things out by publishing spiritual messages from him. However, when we try to correct his ideas by publishing messages from him, his disciples refuse to believe them. Our master's ideas can't be wrong, so they must be trying to change them for the worse. It must be the work of Satan. This is how difficult it is. Even if the founder is mistaken, his disciples can't understand that. So they strictly follow his original words as a golden rule. Early on in his religious career, he focused on the teachings of Buddha and Moses. But he didn't speak about Shintoism, Confucianism, and Taoism because he wasn't interested. So he thought that the Shinto gods were in the sixth dimensional godly realm. You may wonder, the godly realm is the sixth dimension? The seventh dimension is the bodhisattva realm, so shouldn't the godly realm be higher? The founders seemed to believe the Shinto gods were sixth dimensional spirits. He didn't think highly of Confucianism or Taoism. He didn't care about them. He didn't talk to Amaterasu Omikami. He believed Shinto gods were only performing purification and that Buddhism was more advanced because he didn't have time. His claim that Shinto gods were in the sixth dimension is now causing trouble. When I revealed that some Shinto gods are high spirits, his disciples got confused. They think they aren't supposed to be high, but they give advanced teachings. Confucius and Mencius must be in the sixth dimension. But at Happy Science, Confucius is in the ninth dimension. I can't believe it. So religious leaders must bear a heavy responsibility. They can speak on what they found to be true, but they must stay silent about what they have yet to confirm. This is why, though I still have much more to share, I haven't released them. I would like you to understand our standpoint. We want to build a firm foundation before we start to teach the laws. Happy Science members among you may have already read the rules of membership. It says those who have joined Happy Science need to explore the right mind daily. But many have forgotten about it, even if they were inspired by it when they joined. That was exactly what I did for the first six years. Without exploring the right mind daily, we can't communicate with high spirits. There are no exceptions. It's a rule. One must have the same state of mind as the high spirits to communicate with them. Some of you may be members of Seicho no Ie, so I'll talk about it. Recently, we published spiritual messages from Nasaharu Taniguchi. Some executives of the group seem to think, based on our teachings, God doesn't work through mediums. Since Taniguchi is a high spirit near God, he can't come down to a human. He's back in a higher realm, so he can't work through a human. 
This shows they only know one aspect of the truth. At Seicho no Ie, there is no theory that distinguishes a prophet from a medium. God doesn't work through those who make a living as mediums. That's true. However, God does work through prophets. The word prophet doesn't mean predictor. Prophets convey the words of God. One example is Moses, who led the Exodus 3,200 years ago. Moses heard the voice of God named Yahweh. To be precise, this God was a divine spirit of the ninth dimension. Moses could hear that voice because he was a prophet. It was his work and mission to convey the words of God. Elijah was another prophet from about 2,800 years ago. Alone, he confronted 500 priests of Baalism on Mount Carmel to destroy their mistaken belief in Baal. The worship of Baal was a belief to satisfy earthly desires. Misguided priests taught that Baal would grant people whatever they wished for. Elijah believed in Yahweh and said, I believe in the one and only God, Yahweh. Then let us battle to see which is the true God, Baal or Yahweh. The confrontation on Mount Carmel started early in the morning. Five hundred worshippers of Baal built an altar. And prayed to Baal to ignite it by sending fireballs from heaven. They prayed from 9 a.m. till noon, but there was no fire from heaven. Believers of Baal were baffled. This can't be happening. Baal would never forsake us. The 500 believers prayed till 3 p.m. After 2 p.m., they got exhausted and finally began to dance about while covered in blood. They prayed aloud while slashing each other with swords. Please bring down fire, but still no fire appeared. On seeing this, Elijah mocked them. Then I will pray to my God, Yahweh. He was only 27 and was young. There was jealousy, of course. Elijah began to pray. Soon after, fireballs and burning stones. Roared down from the sky onto his altar, setting it ablaze. Believers of Baal were annihilated. In the past, there were such times. He was indeed a prophet. More recently, Jesus Christ was also a prophet. I'd like you to read his words carefully. When Jesus was asked by some people, You say, the Father in heaven sent me down. But where is the proof that the Father of God exists? Show us. To that, Jesus answered, The Father in heaven can't be shown to you directly. But the words I speak are not mine. The Heavenly Father descends on me and now speaks. 
Christians don't understand what this means, but I do. The great divine spirit came down and spoke through Jesus. Other divine spirits like Yahweh, Moses, and Elijah preach through Jesus. Or rather, they gave him inspiration when he preached. So Jesus used to say, Believe my words. Those who hear me hear the voice of God, because he has come and is now speaking. Jesus was conveying God's words. Therefore, he was a prophet and not a medium. Muhammad was another prophet. He was a merchant. When he was 25 years old, he became ill and poor. And eventually collapsed on a hot sunny day as he had nothing to eat. Then came a beautiful widow of around 40, leading her caravan. She stopped her caravan and ordered her people to help Muhammad. For three days, he received her care and finally recovered. He stayed at her house for a while. One morning at around five o'clock, Muhammad had a dream. In the dream, he walks up a hill near Mecca and finds a cave. In the cave, there is a shovel. And as he digs a hole, he finds treasure. The dream was so vivid that he decided to confirm it. He sneaked out of the house while his wife was still sleeping. Approaching the outskirts of Mecca, there he saw a hill. Walking up the hill, he found a cave, just like in his dream. Muhammad entered the cave and eventually sat down. Before he knew it, he fell asleep. Then a loud voice echoed throughout the cave. Muhammad, I am God, Allah. He was astonished. Allah was the God who appeared in Genesis in the Old Testament. He thought he heard the voice of the God of creation and was surprised. Then he realized the significance of this spiritual experience. So he went home and without telling anyone, he took food to the cave. There he struggled for 40 days. He received revelations from Allah and messages from Gabriel. Allah spoke to him over a few sessions, and Archangel Gabriel taught him about the specific laws. This is how the Quran, the teachings of Islam, was made. The Quran is a book of spiritual messages similar to ours. Muhammad compiled God's words, but because there was neither a recorder nor a stenographer, he listened attentively and memorized the messages, word for word, and had someone else record them. Throughout history, 
High spirits have been born as prophets to convey God's words. Now we are in the same position. But just as there were no complete teachings in the past, our teachings will never be enough, no matter how hard we try. As for the truth beyond my understanding, unfortunately, I can't preach it to you. You are studying words of high spirits, but they are all within my scope of understanding. I have a slightly higher level of understanding of the truth than the words written in the books of spiritual messages. However, as for the things beyond my abilities, high spirits can't speak about them through me. There is such a limit. I've talked about how careful we have been in exploring the truth and the way of thinking that lies at the root of it. As I'll explain in the principle of happiness, we place importance on knowledge. This knowledge is not knowledge for school exams, but knowledge of truth. Without it, one cannot distinguish right from wrong. If you examine religious teachings and philosophies against the knowledge of truth in our books, you will find inconsistencies. This means that our books contain certain tacit criticisms. After all, knowledge is power. Today, there is a religious leader who says, rip off the head. It's a good idea to rip off a head full of wrong ideas. But you shouldn't get rid of a head full of the truth. It's no use getting rid of Socrates' head. So I'd like you to start by acquiring the knowledge of truth. Studying the truth is the first step. Some of you who joined Happy Science recently received the exam paper for May seminar and thought, Oh, I can't do this. It's too hard. I should cancel my membership. You might also think, but before I do, I'll go see Ruho Okawa. I can quit after that. People will have different opinions, but this is what I want to say. Publishing one spiritual message took hundreds of hours. That's how much energy we spend to publish one book. What's more, it took dozens of times longer to collect knowledge as the basis of these messages. So I spend hundreds of hours to make one book. How long does it take you to read one? Quick readers may finish in two hours and slow readers in ten hours. And they say they've read it three or four times. That is fine. But we spend dozens of times longer to make one book. Thus, we are absorbing the truth in that way. So please don't be satisfied after reading them just once. It is important to check and see whether you have assimilated what you have read. Nowadays, you can find many teachers who can teach you academic studies, but there is nowhere you can go to check whether your understanding of the truth is correct. Of course, we intend to spread the truth throughout the world. But our basic principle is to first strengthen the inside and then the outside. Or to build the foundations and then the pillars. So I want you to study the truth before you convey it. 
What will you convey? If it is only to sell our books, our publisher is already doing it for us. That's not the point. To convey the truth, you must study it, and before that, you must explore it. The order is important. Explore, study, and convey the truth. Our organization is not yet firmly established. At this stage, it's no use promoting our books. By simply saying that we've released new spiritual messages, if people think we are out of our minds, it's no good. I want you to first study the truth thoroughly for a few years. Just as I spent six years creating the foundation of happy science, consider what you want to convey. As Jesus Christ said, if a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. New religions often create problems because those who haven't yet attained enlightenment try to enlighten others and draw them in by force. It happened to me three times. It's fine if they were enlightened. If a wonderful person with much knowledge and mastery of the truth came and talked to you, you would willingly give some offerings. But that's not usually the case. They try to drag people in by force. I don't like such behavior, and I'm sure you would feel the same way. So explore and study the truth before conveying it. I want happy science to remain patient and be a group that studies the truth for the first one or two years. We'll naturally grow. Many people want to be our members now. Based on my estimate, we'll probably grow to 4,000 or 5,000 by the end of this year if we accept everyone. However, we don't have any lecturers yet. Increasing people at this stage would only cause confusion. I don't think it would be wise to open branches just for me to preach around. So in the first few years, I want to nurture people who have knowledge of truth to teach others. I want to train lecturers or the core members of our missionary work. Many are eager to start branches, but first, I would like you to understand what we are trying to convey. We've now published 10 books, but this is just the beginning. We are simply telling you that such spiritual phenomena can occur and that the spiritual world exists. From here on out, we will be teaching the real laws. So before you think of conveying anything, please study. To explain what I am saying now in Buddhist terms, Hinayana comes before Mahayana. You can only save others after attaining enlightenment. When you reverse this order, tragedy occurs in religion. So find happiness for yourself before trying to make others happy. Hinayana, then Mahayana. We are still at the Hinayana stage of Buddhism. I can't wait to spread the truth worldwide. But Hinayana comes before Mahayana. I myself have not attained ultimate enlightenment, so I can't preach advanced teachings to people. This applies to you, too. A member in South Korea is eager to publish spiritual messages from Christ. I can understand this desire to spread it, but I want us to control it for now. I hope you will understand the meaning of this. Finally, I would like to address the main theme of this lecture. As I wrote in the pamphlet, An Introduction to Happy Science, we advocate the principle of happiness. There are numerous ways to become happy. 
But the happiness we seek is the happiness that carries over from this world to the next. It's not the sort of happiness you can only enjoy in this world. You can learn that sort of happiness somewhere else. We are exploring the principles of happiness that apply to the past, present, and future. The starting point of this principle is the attitude to explore the right mind. What is the right mind? I am saying we should explore our Tathagata within. You may think Tathagatas are greater than Bodhisattvas, and Bodhisattvas in the spirits and the light realm. However, you shouldn't judge people by their spiritual level alone. The diamond within everyone is essentially the same. The only difference is the refinement of the diamond as the result of reincarnations. Those who have made efforts to polish the diamond within are who we call guiding spirits. So you can all refine your inner diamond and it will shine. However, no one can become a Tathaga instantly. Your diamond will not suddenly shine. To make it shine, you have to make tireless efforts. That is the exploration of the right mind. It is the spiritual discipline to discover your true nature. Through this daily effort, you will enter the next stage where you seek true happiness. The first principle in the principle of happiness is love. This love is not the kind of love where you want someone to love you. The love I teach is love that gives. What is love that gives? Is it the act of giving money? No, it's not. The true nature of love that gives comes from awakening to the fact that you and others are one and the same, that all human beings are children of God who split off from Him. You and others seem different, but your true nature is one and the same. This is the basis of love. Because you think you are different from others, friction and discord arise. Once we realize that we are all children of God, we will naturally love one another. What is love? It's to wish good for others and to wish to nurture others. It's a selfless love without expecting anything in return. Because your essence and the essence of others are the same, you are required to love others just as you love yourself. We can love ourselves without being taught to do so. But sadly, once we dwell in a physical body, we forget to love others. So I need to teach love that gives. Another word that describes love that gives is mercy. The teaching of love sounds very Christian. But love that gives is the basis of Shakyamuni Buddha's teachings. In modern terms, Shakyamuni taught, start by giving love. Love that gives means mercy. This is the first principle of happiness. The second principle is wisdom. It is important to have correct knowledge of the truth. Without this knowledge, humans can't be free in the truest sense. 
I myself feel truly free because I am confident that I know many things. For example, Christian missionaries come to Japan and try hard to convert people to save them. They say, throw away the Buddhist altar or else you can't enter heaven. They may be pure in heart and devoted, but they don't know the truth. They believe that without abandoning heretical Buddhism, they can't go to heaven. Once they convert people to Christianity, they say, now you can go to heaven. High spirits feel sad when they see this. Jesus has been ashamed of this for 2,000 years. Christians believe that only Christianity can save people because they don't know the truth. They earnestly believe in Jesus, but Jesus feels regret toward other spirits. He thinks there is truth in Buddhism and Shinto, but because I didn't teach this, they say such things. So I'd like you to have the correct knowledge of the truth. This is what is meant by the truth will set you free. The third principle is self-reflection. It's related to the exploration of the right mind. We are essentially all children of God with shining souls. However, just as a diamond accumulates dirt if it is left untouched, our souls collect dust as we live in this world. This diamond has to be polished. And this is our spiritual discipline. Of course, there may be help from other power, such as a polishing specialist. Sometimes we need such help. But we should polish our own diamond. If not, what's the meaning of discipline in this world? Why do we each have a unique character? It's because each of us is expected to develop our unique selves. If you realize you have made a mistake, who can correct it other than yourself? Although someone else could wash your physical body. Only you can cleanse your soul. Self-reflection is based on self-power. It's very important. Please start here. It's no use plating metal before removing rust. The shiny surface will soon peel away. The monism of light is the truth, but it is a teaching of Tathagatas. There is no Tathagata among you in this world. One can become a Tathagata in a leap if you are a step away, but no one is there yet. Self-reflection is the path to our heart, the upper realm of the sixth dimension. Our heart is the stage of angels to be, or gateway to bodhisattvas. Before becoming a bodhisattva, self-reflection is essential. To become an arhat, you must remove dirt from your mind and emit a halo. Some people say it's too strict because only one-third of the applicants can join us. But this is still lenient. In times of Shakyamuni Buddha, you couldn't join unless you emitted a halo after self-reflecting. We have hundreds of members here, but if the same conditions were applied, you'd have to take back your registration, return your sutra books, and self-reflect until you are ready. But in today's world, if I say you have to do so, other religious leaders would be angry. How can you gather members? So I'd like you to aim first for the love of our heart in this lifetime. You have different karma and stages of development, but everyone without exception can attain the level of our heart. 
It's much harder to go beyond this stage. But through discipline, you can become an arhat. That's why there is self-reflection. Above all, I want to produce 1,000 arhats. Because 1,000 arhats can change a whole nation. When they work as politicians, teachers, and business leaders, they will influence people around them. An arhat can influence 50 or even 100 people. So 1,000 arhats will gradually influence about 100,000 people. I believe this is the right way to spread the truth. The step after self-reflection is the fourth principle, progress. If people seek progress without self-reflection, some will most likely stumble. It would be like plating metal before removing the rust. It would be in vain because you can't plate rusted metal with gold. So first attain the level of arhat and then leap to Tathagata. The monism of light is the teaching of Tathagatas. To become a Tathagata who embodies God's light, you should first become an arhat. Only when you become an arhat can you become a bodhisattva. Bodhisattva is a stage of saving people. But before saving, you need to know your true nature. That is an arhat. And through the practice of loving others, arhats become bodhisattvas. Bodhisattvas then proceed to the Tathagata realm, where there is no darkness, no evil, and no shadow, only light. So dualism doesn't conflict with the monism of light. It's a matter of the different stages. Eighty percent of people first need to self-reflect in duality. And those who clean their souls can become Tathagatas. It's a fact since there are levels in the spirit world. Those in the fourth dimension can't leap into the eighth. They first need to go to the fifth dimension, then the sixth, and then the seventh and eighth. You cannot suddenly skip over the dimensions. Progress comes after self-reflection. I'd like you all to make progress. Without it, there's no true happiness. The last in the principle of happiness is progress. The development of the self and then of others in society. The ultimate goal is to build Buddha land utopia. I would like you to follow this path. The four principles, love, wisdom, self-reflection, and progress, are the modern fourfold path to true happiness. I'd like you all to start from this. This is the first gateway to the Hinayana path that I teach. Later, there are further steps, but first, I'd like you to explore the fourfold path of love, wisdom, self-reflection, and progress. Then you will feel true happiness. I'm sure about that. My talk is getting long, so I'll end it here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Master Okawa. And thank you, you are watching, listening to that uh, long lecture. And I, I want to give you a quick, quick summary or quick explanation of this lecture by five points. Firstly, a master talk about his history to become a religious leader at the age of 30, 30 just 30. Okay, now it's about 36 years ago. Okay. So uh, as for his uh, history to become a religious leader, we have a cinema, a master's uh, history in the movie. It is called uh, Twice Born. It is available here 
if you want to watch this movie, you can ask Rumi. Uh, anyway, you, 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 can, you could come. I recommend listen or watch this movie too. Second point is uh, building a solid foundation. It is very important. Master uh, used six years before he studied to happy science because he need to have a solid foundation of truth. It applies to us all. Uh, because of that, we need to learn, study the teaching of happy science first. Okay. Uh, if you are a newcomer, it will take up at least one year, two year to grasp the whole picture of the happy science teaching. So uh, please uh, read or listen to master lecture uh, as much as you can in a year or two and understand which what kind of teaching happy science are. But if you are interested in most in happy science, uh, I should recommend you read The Laws of the Sun, the book I put there. This is the extensive teaching about happy science. You know what the El Cantar is and happy science is through this book, I, I uh, think, I believe. Then uh, we are happy science followers are encouraged to become Arhat, then Bodhisattva. Uh, Bodhisattva is a goal to, to our enlightenment usually, but uh, it is big, big, uh, very, very difficult. Uh, we can't live in that state uh, instantly. So we need to have a solid foundation, study the teachings, uh, and also we need to clean our mind by self-reflection. It will take years, years. So first, we should become arhat. It is a low-level angel or angel to be. This is our goal, first goal. So as I put in the before the lecture, arhat, is angel to be, then come the bodhisattva, angels, angels. Then archangel, it's very, very high level. We can't usually become that, become that level, uh, but we can aim to become bodhisattva, angels, if possible. Before that, we must aim to be angel to be, that is called arhat in Buddhist time. Okay. And uh, there's one question about uh, this lecture. Who is Master Riho Kawa? Who is Master Riho Kawa? And he positioned himself as a prophet at this time. It was March 1, 1987. Because uh, Happy Science at the time, very few books. Uh, he already, now, now he already published more than 3,000 books, more 3,000 impressive number of books. But at the time, only 10 books of spiritual messages, all spiritual messages, no theoretical book at the time. First theoretical book, The Rose of Sun, published two, uh, two months later, May of 1987. So he positioned himself as a prophet who convey the words of God, words of high spirit, like Jesus Christ, Muhammad, uh, yeah, Moses, and uh, Elijah. These kind of people are prophets that convey the words of God to people living here. The same way, Master Yuhokawa convey the words of God or high spirit through spiritual reading, uh, spiritual writing or spiritual message, and then made it into the books. So at this point, he positioned himself as a prophet. So he talked about uh, many historical prophets. But, uh, but after he published, published three important books in Japanese, uh, which is Laws of Sun, Laws, Golden Laws, and the Eternity, Laws, Eternity, Laws of Eternity. Three three These three books consist the basic of happy science teaching. After he completed these three teachings, he declared himself as a reverse of Buddha. It was December of 1987, at the end of that year. He said he was actually a reverse of Buddha. 
which teach his own teaching because he has enlightened and as a uh, Buddha in heaven. So he is same as the Buddha in heaven. So he can teach his own teaching. So he is not a prophet. Uh, he can do the uh, uh, he can do the uh, same as prophet, but he can preach his own teaching. That is Buddha. Then, then, uh, after three or uh, four years from this point, in July 1997, he declared himself as a Lord El Cantare, which is a central core consciousness of Shakyamuni Buddha, greater than Shakyamuni Buddha. And he is uh, he is the highest god in this earthly realm, earthly world. So he declared his, um, himself as El Cantara, which uh, which isn't in this lecture at all. But uh, later that that came. This is the third point. And then he talked about the principle of happiness, principle of happiness, and. Uh, we are talking about happiness that carries over from this world to the next. The happiness not only in this world, happiness not only in the other world, the happiness that carries over from this world to the other. What kind of happiness is that? It is a happiness called enlightenment. The enlightenment is happiness that can can we uh, that we can attain this world and we can carry it to the other world. It is a high level of enlightenment, a high level of awareness as spirituality. If you if you successfully elevate your spirituality while you are you are living, you can carry that kind of a state state into the next world. So if you could attain enlightenment of bodhisattva in this world while you are living. You will be in the body. You will be with a bodhisattva in the heavenly world after you leave this world. So, it is happiness we are seeking. Is that this kind of uh, enlightenment? It's a happiness we are seeking in happy science. And then Master talked about uh, principles of happiness: love, wisdom, and Self-reflection, progress. Uh, I can't, I can't delve into these four teaching, uh, but this combination is very, very important. We don't focus on only one teaching. We don't only focus on only love, only self-reflection. Love is uh, particular great in the Christianity. Self-reflection is in the uh, Buddhism. Uh, these things are uh, kind of a Historically, traditionally, there's just important teaching. But we also have wisdom, progress. These are kind of new teachings applied to modern world. The happy science is very uh, adaptive to the modern world because we have uh, these kind of two teachings, wisdom and uh, progress. So okay, these, uh, these four pillars are very, very important. And this is... Uh, in the first lecture Master gave, he taught these four principles. But this four principle is still exists, and it is a main teaching we have. The, all the teaching Master taught is uh, okay classified into these four teaching four pillars. Please remember this teaching. Sorry. Okay, conclusion. What is happy science? You might think, what is happy science? Happy science is a great spiritual movement to create Buddha land utopia in the world, creating Buddha land utopia world by producing innumerable bodhisattvas or angels. Okay, so it is very important that each one of us to aspire to become angels, aspire to elevate our enlightenment. 
in this life to become angels. As Master Oka told us, uh, whoever, uh, okay, every one of us become at least our heart in this lifetime. It's angel to be. And if, if you are lucky enough, we can become angel or bodhisattva in this lifetime. So it is a very special thing, only in happy science. There's no reason other than happy science that gave us the opportunity to become the way to become angels or bodhisattvas. Okay. It's not only for the kind of priests, but also for the lay, lay believers. All the believers should, Master said, aim to become a heart at least or become bodhisattva. This is a, a very special point for happy science. So please aspire like that. <laughs> please aspire and learn, study the teaching diligently and polish your mind through the teaching and aim to become a great person, okay? That is not the egoism. That is to contribute to the uh, society, the world, also contribute to the God. This is the conclusion, okay? Okay, uh, we have a weekly Sunday service session. Uh, this time we have, today is uh, uh, August 6th, and we had a, uh, master's lecture, first lecture. The second lecture will be shown in the 20s. It will be a principle of love. Uh, master said four principles. He gave the lecture on, on each four principles one by one. So first principle, principle of love will come in on the 20s, the day, uh, week after next. The next week, we have a memorial ceremony of, for ancestors. So you can please join together, okay? Okay, uh, this is my the conclusion. This is uh, the end of this my my this uh, Sunday service today. Thank you very much for your listening and joining. Thank you very much. Oh, do you have any question? Something? Okay. Uh, you can talk there uh, outside.